everybody and happy new year to all of you. This month on Perfectly Palm Beach, we're going to be focusing on health because the new year is a perfect time to renew your body, mind, and spirit. And today I'm so excited to be talking to my friend and author, Deborah Goodrich Royce, and she is so successful. Three fantastic books, guys. Three books. She's already started a fourth. This is the book that she's promoting this month, Reef Road. I literally couldn't put it down. It's a fantastic thriller, lots of wonderful surprises, incredible layers, beautifully written. Can't say enough about it. So come with us inside where we sit down in her library and talk to her about her writing process, what it really means to write a book, how do you write a book, and all about the new plot in this fabulous new book, Reef Road. So Deborah, before we get into talking about all of your books, Finding Mrs. Ford, Ruby Falls, and your brand new one that I adored, Reef Road, I've loved all of them, but this one I really couldn't put down. I really loved it. Um, I know all of our listeners want to know, how did you get here? It's, it's, I know it's been a journey, but everybody has a path that is straight, left, right turns, Tell us about yours. Well, my path has been a very twisted path. I like to say, because I was in film and television, I, I like to use a right. TV term and look at my life as having very distinct episodes, which I think is often true for women. Mm -hmm. I think, well, let me rephrase that. I think women expect and are accustomed to having a life led in episodes. I think men are becoming a little bit more accustomed to it because mm -hmm. the world has changed for men. I, I think in earlier times, you know, if you look at the 20th century, whether a man was a corner sweet kind of guy or a factory kind of guy, most men had a career for life. And right. that's not as true anymore. Correct. And I think we as women are way ahead of the curve in knowing how to handle that. So I grew up in suburban Detroit went to college in Ohio, very close to Pennsylvania, which we will touch on all of that. Uh, I did uh, an academic term abroad in my junior year of college and had this idea because I was a foreign language major. I mm -hmm. majored in French and Italian. Oh, look, we have the dog Hello. visiting. Hi, Georgina. Yeah. This is Georgina. Hi, Georgina. So I had this for the camera, idea sweetie. So two things. I went to a very small college where I was able to act in plays, even though I wasn't a theater major, and I was able to be a dance minor. So after I'd studied in France, a movie came to town, to Cleveland, and it was a big United Artists picture mm. with Frank Langella and Tom Hulse, and I was hired as a background dancer. Oh my so God. it was. Wait, how old were you? You were junior I, in college? So it was between my junior and senior mm. year. So I think it gave me the very false idea that this was a, a piece of cake to just kind of <laughs> walk into a movie. And the choreographer invited me to audition for him in New York City. And oh my goodness. As a well, you must have really been able to dance. Well, we'll come to that. <laughs> I was certainly good enough right. to dance in that movie. Right. I did go to New York to audition for him. Wow. He did not cast me. Mm. I, I don't think he was as serious as I thought he was. Mm. I think he was probably, I don't know what. I think he was just saying something. <laughs> and as a Midwesterner, I took it very seriously. Well, right, exactly. So I came to New York and I spent about a year pursuing dance, which mm -hmm. At that time, and maybe it's the same now, you know, there were these dance studios up and down Broadway where you would take classes all day long. Mm -hmm. I auditioned for everything. I got close to many Broadway plays. But about a year in, I realized I wasn't good enough. And I thought, well, I will mm. try acting before I go and maybe go to graduate school. Right. And I had a different experience with acting. With I, I Gosh, did, it was incredible, your success. It, on All My Children. I mean, that was yeah. the time when soap operas were, you know, kind of like the number one shows on television, they were. right? They were. So uh, soap operas at that time, I think they were really good entry-level jobs mm -hmm. and exactly. exit-level jobs. Yes. 
When I left all my children, Paramount Pictures flew me to California to screen test, which seemed very fancy. You have a son who's an actor. Right. And the way I was flown out there, they, they flew me out, coach, they put me in the Hollywood Holiday Inn, and I thought, <laughs> this is really nice. I'm in, I'm yeah. in L.A. now. And uh, I will never forget driving up those uh, that driveway through the Paramount gates, and it was So dazzling. exciting. Oh, of course. So yeah. I had a nice 10 years as an actress in film and television. And then in a series of life changes, my first husband, who'd grown up in Paris, mm. wanted to move back there. We moved in the early 90s to France. Mm. And in another curveball, I started as a reader for a French film studio, which became the, the first And being a step. reader for a studio is almost like being a book editor. Well, not yet. Oh. You're working for the book editor. Okay. Because I ended up then, when we came back to New York, as story editor at Miramax mm -hmm. Films. Mm -hmm. So the readers work for wow. the story editors. Okay. And readers, it's like, you know, piecework in the factory. You're doing, you read the screenplay or the novel, you write a synopsis. You write a synopsis, right. And a page of notes mm -hmm. and a few comparisons. They always want to know, what is this like? Right. What is this like? Just They're, like those query letters. Yeah. Yeah. You, you, it's, it's a formula. <laughs> yeah. So I did that in France, and we came back to New York, and I worked at Miramax, and that's what I did in the wow, 90s. Wow, incredible. Yeah. So Fantastic. I think I've taken you far enough. But how, yeah. do you, how did you become a journalist? I mean, becoming, you know, sitting down and... and Everybody's got a book in them, they say, right? But I think there's only 24% is the number that I have read are, are f female authors at the moment. Now, in the landscape of, of books, that's not, that's not a big number. So breaking through and getting there is a really tough thing. I mean, I know that. Lots of people I know that are writing books feel the same way. How did you sit down and write your first book? So I'd been writing for a long time mm -hmm. in the way that you're talking about the the 75 percent of people write perhaps right. with not as much discipline. I was raising children. Right. Uh, I, I was married twice. I was at Miramax. My husband, my current wonderful husband and I did a lot of restoration projects and for me it was that juncture of the empty nest and I had been in writing groups leading mm -hmm. up to this. So it was very fruitful, I think, for me to be in writing groups because I was getting a feel for what it was about my style that people responded to, my peers. But I read that Gene Wilder, oh, yeah. who was involved with you yeah. in the, the renovation of the Avon Theater in Connecticut, which mm -hmm. we all know about because we're Connecticut people, um, that he was very encouraging. So, Gene so tell Wilder, us about that. Yeah. So Gene Wilder is was as wonderful as you would imagine. Mm, yes. He stayed in Stamford, Connecticut after Gilda Radner died, and he married an extraordinary woman, Karen Wilder. And wow, I had no idea he was a Connecticut oh, yeah. person. Incredible. They were uh, one of the greatest romances I've ever seen. Oh, you're kidding. They would go dancing together. I think they took tap Aww. dancing. Uh, I remember calling I them that. and they had a duet on their answering machine. I love that. So I can't really think of him without thinking of her. And, right. and they were just extraordinary. So in the process, so he did three movies a year at the Avon. By that I mean he would come to the Avon. Mm -hmm. it, it was generally in the autumn, about mm -hmm. a month apart each time. Mm -hmm. And he would talk about a film always two classic films, then one of his own. Mm -hmm. And his fame was such that even in his older years, we had to have security when he was presenting one of his own movies because wow. people would fly in to Stanford, Connecticut to his see groupies, him. His yeah. Incredible Well following. loved, well loved, yeah. So in this process of working together, we had a writing correspondence. And he said in his way, are you a writer? I think you're a writer. And I said, well, you know, kind of, sort of, gee. Wow. And he said, I would be honored to read anything you've written. Mm. So I'd written a screenplay. He read it. He was very encouraging. And he kept saying after that, whenever Chuck and I would see him, are you writing? I hope you're <laughs> writing. You should be writing. I love that. So this moment when my youngest child was grown and flown, 
I had had all this encouragement and I thought, if I'm going to do this, Let's now, do it now is the time. Well, it's not just, I mean, I appreciate having the time because I, I understand that because the first time I really sat down to write something was at a turning point in my life when there had been a lot of people that had passed away and it really affected me and I needed to kind of get that out. Um, but I'm curious, literally, you know, you might want to sit down and write, but there's a whole process, right? So explain to everybody what your process is, where do the, your ideas come from, not just the scheduling and the discipline, but it's developing the ideas and the characters and being able to then translate that onto paper. That's a process that I'm not sure everybody understands. Right. So. People have asked me, do I ever get writer's block? And I say, well, if you consider the first 50 years of my life, yeah, I've had a lot of writer's block. So <laughs> being me, a mother, it's pretty hard to do anything, right? This Except later period kids. of life has been much more of a download of ideas. Mm -hmm. I, I don't know what has shifted with me, but I feel Isn't a little bit- interesting? Yeah, yeah, it's very weird. Wow. I feel more tapped into an idea source. Mm -hmm. I also feel that I structure my time in such a way to make use of the ideas I get. Because mm -hmm. it's one thing to have an idea flip by. You know, I once read that the definition of genius is not having an idea that nobody else has ever had. Mm. The definition of genius is either putting it into words, putting it into practice, Correct building the thing, creating right. the thing. Right, doing it. Where other yeah. people say, ah, I thought that, I felt that, I recognized that. Right. So there's that commonality we have. So how I began, and we're going back eight years, I started do that. by taking my trusty electronic devices like my iPhone or my computer and blocking out windows of time. Mm -hmm. Because I have other commitments, as many of us do. Right. I couldn't always do the right at the same time every morning that most writers yeah. recommend. Mm -hmm. So as long as I had at least a three hour chunk, three to six hours. Every day. Tried for every day. Mm -hmm. It grew to be every day. Uh, about seven months into my first book, I was sitting with a friend of mine who's written seven books. Her name's Harriet Cole. And she said to me, she said, how many days a week are you writing, Deborah? And I said, well, I'm writing one or two days a week. She said, you will never finish your book <laughs> at that rate. And she was right. So I had to switch that up. And it was, so it wasn't instantaneous discipline, mm -hmm. but it was, let's say, instantaneous commitment to discipline and then just making the changes, dropping other things. I don't go to lunch, for example. Right. Lunch kills the day. It does kill the day. Yeah. So there are people that I've talked to through my own writing process, and they say, you know, when I meditate, the ideas come to me. When I'm in the shower, the ideas, you know, different places where the rest of the noise in your head is drowned out, and somehow all those ideas come together. Then you sit down and you start researching and you kind of figure that all out. Is there a place? where that happens for you when you're walking, laying in bed at night, where does that happen for you? So that's a really good point. I do have and have had for many, many years a meditation practice. Mm -hmm. I'm not a great See, meditator. I knew that. But I, I do it. Yes, I can tell yeah. that mm -hmm. you have that because there's a serenity in the midst of all of you that, you, that comes through. Mm -hmm. And I'm so glad that we're even talking about that because you know January is such a great time. Perfectly Palm Beach is gonna focus on on health and body, mind, and spirit, and taking care of your body. And it was one of the things I wanted to ask you was, how do you take care of yourself? So but. I make a point of getting up every morning. I drink coffee. I mean, I, there are some people who might not drink coffee. They, I, I have quit coffee for periods, but I find it doesn't do anything different to my. I don't drink I a totally lot of agree. coffee, but I, I drink it. I'm the same way. So I quietly get a cup of coffee, mm -hmm. and I go to a quiet place before I check the news, before I check social media, mm -hmm. I read something uplifting and I draw from a variety of sources and traditions. I mean spiritually or religiously yeah, or like something. A dear friend of mine recently gave me an incredible book by Tolstoy. Mm. So Leo Tolstoy, 
at the end of his life, spent years collecting some of the greatest religious and philosophical teachers of the world and compiling a selection for every day. Mm. I think he spent six years at the end of his life doing this. Wow, I didn't know that. Interesting. Yeah. And then when the Ru Russian Revolution came, the mm -hmm. Soviet Union just pushed it aside. It mm -hmm. was a banned book. And a Canadian editor in the 1990s resurrected this book. I hadn't heard of it till someone gave it to me. So I've started 2023, that's what we are, right? Yeah, we with are, this that's right. story book. Oh my and gosh, it, we have to get that, boys. It that might sounds be good for all Buddhist, of us. Christian, yes. Jewish scholars, ancient Love Greeks, that. ancient Romans, and then he ties it together with thoughts Love of that. Zen. Oh my gosh, so, so that's how you start your day. Yeah, Okay. I read something like that, and then I set a timer on my phone to meditate. And I'm a five, 10 minute girl, I yeah. am not, I, I, I can't do yeah. more than 10 minutes yeah. either. But regardless of whatever your process is, it brought you to this phenomenal third book of yours called Reef Road. So tell our listeners a little bit about the book. There are a couple things I want to ask you about it. I literally couldn't put it down. I thought it was, and I'm not a huge thriller girl. I mean, it's not like the first kind of book I go to read. I literally was captivated. So, so, so tell yeah, us a little bit so about it. So Reef Road is a thriller. It, it has is, a, yeah. a plot-driven thriller component, but it is also a deeply philosophical Absolute, meditation yes. on generational trauma. No question. Yeah. My mother's best friend was murdered in Pittsburgh in 1948 on Ugh. December the 10th. Oh, my gosh. And Yeah. It remained an unsolved crime. Ugh. And when something like that happens, if you look at people like Dominic Dunn, whose yes. daughter was murdered. Yeah. Oh boy, yes. Uh, and then he went on to become this huge advocate journalist yeah. who really covered sensational crimes. Or you look at someone like Michelle McNamara. She'd grown up outside of Chicago and a, a girl in her town was murdered. And then she grew up to become what they call a citizen detective, where she delved extensively into a series of murders around California that for a long while mm. they thought were committed by different people, but mm -hmm. in fact it was one guy. Ugh. And she was instrumental in solving that case. Mm. So there is this syndrome right. um, among people whose lives are kind of next door to extreme acts of violence. Mm. And th the victim of the violence is in a way, not the only victim. There, there are consequences. Uh, the book Mystic River by Dennis Lehane right. talks about that. There's a terrible right. act committed against a boy by mm -hmm. a priest and mm -hmm. it affects everybody in his life going forward. So I've always known my mother's friend was murdered. Uh, I've always known it had an effect on my mother, particularly the unsolved component of it. And she was a little girl when it happened, She was right? 12, yeah. and her friend was 12, and yeah. it was a gruesome murder. And so in March of 2020, I was here in this house in Palm Beach, Florida, on my way to promote another book. And as we all know, the world shut down. So this was a really beautiful place to be in that shutdown. Mm -hmm. But I turned my attention to the very dreary subject matter of this murder of my mother's best friend. Mm. And I discovered there was a tremendous amount of material on the internet. There were all kinds of newspaper articles, just dozens and dozens. Mm. There were books there. Um, I was able to go through the University of Pittsburgh and obtain the coroner's report. I was not able to get the police report from the Pittsburgh Police Department presumably because mm. it's still an open case mm. all these years later. And I spent many weeks of that initial lockdown researching the real murder, taking notes. Mm. And I, so I like to write fiction. I think in fiction, you can get to core truths of what's going on without the encumbrance of too many details of facts. For example, the real girl who was murdered had two brothers. Mm -hmm. An early editor 
read a draft of the book and said, well, why do you have this extra brother? It's just confusing, like which brother is which? I was able, through fiction, to eliminate an unessential character that you just wouldn't be able to in nonfiction mm -hmm. because yes, of it, course. it's right. not factual. Right. So what evolved was the story of a Palm Beach writer mm -hmm. who is deeply immersed in investigating the murder of her mother's best friend in Pittsburgh. And at the same time, you have another woman, a younger woman who lives on the beautiful Reef Road, which is on the north end of Palm Beach. I spent a lot of time riding my bike up and down Reef Road. I picked a house that is Linda Alonzo's house. She's the younger woman. And as the pandemic, so I said it in the pandemic lockdown period in which I was writing it. Mm -hmm. So the younger woman, a few weeks into this lockdown, her husband and young children disappear. He's a very handsome fellow from Argentina named Miguel Alonso. And he's last seen at Miami International in his face mask, getting on a plane with two children yeah. bound for Buenos Aires. Right. She cannot follow. Correct. So we can talk a little <laughs> bit about the pandemic. The book is not about the pandemic. No, it's not. But the pandemic imposes walls around the, the characters. The isolation all, for all of them. It's constraints. It's right. like wartime. But while I was reading it, I was like, how is, how is this woman dealing without her children? I couldn't breathe if my right. children were missing for more than you know 15 minutes. Her kids are on an airplane, and she's cleaning the house and having an affair and doing... I mean, it was... It, it, it finally dawned on me that there was there was more to the story. <laughs> There's more to the yes, story. Yeah. There's more to everybody's and story. And it's so always. beautifully written. Yeah. It's beautifully written. It really is. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, but it's a great, it's not just a straight thriller, everybody. There's a layer on a layer on a layer. It keeps you engaged. It's, again, it's beautifully written. And the one when I finished it, I put it down and I thought about it for a little bit. And then when I was on the beach with my husband in the afternoon, we were talking about the generational aspect of scars that follow you from generation to generation. And I have to read you a quote that I have from William Faulkner, and I want, then I want to ask you about, about it. So he says, the past is never dead. It's not even a past. Yeah. So after writing this book, do you think that our past lives, and I don't mean you know, from a hundred years ago, our past lives from the de different generations, do you think they follow us? Yes, and I think it happens actually at a genetic level. And I just it's finished- It's so fascinating there's a that book you say that, wow. Called, It Didn't Start With You. Mm. And the book begins, well, there's case after case after case, but mm -hmm. in mice, a scientists have introduced a particular smell into the cages of mice mm -hmm. and then given them an electric shock. Mm. Two generations later, their grandchildren, when they experience that smell, have reactions of stress and anxiety. So how he describes oh, it, and I'm amazing. not a scientist, mm. he said the genes don't change, but the genetic affect changes. So something happens Wait, to Wait, say us. that again, the genes don't... The actual genes don't change. Right. But the genetic affect changes. Wow. How the genes function, how they perform. One of the first psychologists to document cases of children of Auschwitz and other concentration camp survivors mm -hmm. was a Canadian doctor who noticed cases of depression, cases of anxiety right. in their children. And these are children who didn't experience the actual trauma firsthand. Mm -hmm. So I think that's when the conversation really began. Well, mm. the, the conversation began with the ancients in the Bible, you know, the, the sins of the father, the seventh generation, right. it's the ancient Greeks, the yes, Romans, yes. biblical scholars, right. you know. So, so this book that I just read, it mm. didn't start with you. Mm -hmm. What he would say, the author, is one of mm. the therapeutic techniques for giving that back is doing meditations. Let's say you have a grandmother who was killed at Auschwitz. You would sit, and I don't know all of it, you would picture her 
and lovingly say, this is yours. This Correct. is not mine. Yes. And give it back. Right. That was um, your path. It's not mine. Right. But that's the whole concept of literally being able to change the patterns, being aware enough and conscious enough. So this is a little bit more of the spiritual enhancement that we hope each generation has to kind of break the pattern. Right. Yeah. It, consciousness. It requires consciousness. It does. It really does. So was that a concept that you started with when you kind of put this whole incredible plot together or did it just kind of flow as you were writing? Well, I'm more of a flower. I did want to examine <laughs> generational trauma mm -hmm. and uh, the parallel storyline of Linda Alonzo and her family mm -hmm. was, you know, pure imagination. And I think I was influenced in that storyline by a noir thriller like uh, Body Heat, which was shot in Lantana. <gasps> Such an amazing movie oh, for all great you movie. young people. Yeah. That's with uh, Bill Hurt and Kathleen, Kathleen Turner. Turner at the height of her incredible yeah. popularity. Oh, she was incredible. Yeah. And that movie captured, like all noir thrillers, mm -hmm. the very questionable integrity of the female, which mm. noir always does. Mm. And, but that Florida heat and humidity yeah. and the yeah. oppressiveness. Yes. Now we have more air conditioning, so <laughs> it was a little harder to get to that. But, no, it comes through. The yeah. heat definitely comes through. The like, you know, you want to hold your breath because you just can't believe, you know, mm -hmm. kind of the things that are happening. But also, we're residents down here, so we know how oppressive the heat actually is physically. Right. During that time frame. So right. during the summertime. And it was interesting writing it sort of day and date with what was going on. Mm -hmm. And I, I, someone once said about writing, if you just write down what's going on every day, you're writing history. <laughs> so there are little things in the book, like there's a moment when the writer flips on the TV and that ship is coming into New York Harbor and it was called Comfort and it was supposed to be a floating hospital mm -hmm. and there was a field hospital in Correct. Central Park. Yeah. And it was shocking in yeah. our time shocking. to think yeah. that we had field hospitals in the middle of New York City. Right. And Morgs. so there's, there's just yeah. a glimpse of that in here. Yeah. But I think it it serves to root you in the time and place. So it's almost like historical fiction then. Right. Yeah. Well, I am, as your friend and somebody who really respects you enormously, as somebody who's trying to write a book, <laughs> um, I, I'm so proud of you that you have these three books. I think your journey has been incredible. And I, I loved this book. I thought the writing was so just beautiful and so succinct. And I know it's going to be a huge hit and people are going to love it. So is there a fourth? I, know, I mean, I don't even need to ask you. Of course, there's a fourth one coming. Well, I started a book. It's funny you should say. <laughs> I um. I'll say a little bit about yeah, it. Yeah, give us, give us the and scoop on Perfectly Palm Beach. Launching a book tour, I'm not going to finish it in, in a quick way. I have about 100 pages. Mm. I got an email from a fellow last year, uh, several months back, and he said, Hi, do you remember me? Ooh. I was your best boy on Survival Game. Now, that's a very provocative sentence. So people who are in the film business would know that a best boy is a head electrician. Oh, it's just the terminology they use Oh my goodness, I didn't know that. Wow, okay. Survival Game was a movie I did. Okay. So I read the first sentence and I thought, huh, that's interesting. And he said, remember when we had Thanksgiving dinner together, you were the only actress who didn't go home or have relatives visit you on the set. And I thought, huh. I don't remember that. He did. I did the movie. Yeah. So I'm still scratching my head. And he said, remember when I saw you at the Cannes Film Festival and you were holding a baby and you waved to me and I wondered for a moment if I was the father of that baby, but I knew it wasn't <laughs> possible. And I'm thinking, I don't remember any of this. I mean, I remember I was in those places. Correct. I right. looked him up. I, I could see who he was, but it got me thinking, mm. what if you have a woman who has a flawed memory for one reason or another? What if you have a woman who has something in her past? What mm. if you have 
a husband who's maybe not reliable. What if this, what if that? So right now I'm playing with the concept of best boy. That's what I'm calling it I because love that. I just love that term. I love that. I love that term too. That's so mm -hmm. fantastic. I have seen different things on social media just to kind of end here because I know so many people that are listening, you know, are really curious about writing books. And I'm just curious to get your take on this. I, I saw something on social media the other day which is just even a weird concept that I even say that in my daily life. I saw something on social media. Instead of saying, oh yeah, somebody told me this, it's like something that you're reading on your different social media platforms. That uh, it was a course that they offered. If you have a nonfiction book in you, I will teach you how to do it. Write that book in 30 days. And I was like, oh, come on. That's just the craziest thing in the whole world. I do think people go to memoir classes. Mm -hmm. I definitely know of a lot of friends who do memoir workshops, and mm -hmm. they've been extremely formative in shaping their memoirs, which okay. they later sold. Okay, so there you um, go. So I'm wrong, everybody. That's I, interesting. I have been in writing okay. groups, and the kind of writing groups I'm in, it's with writer peers, mm -hmm. uh, which I have found very helpful. I have gone to a one writer's conference the cool thing about a writer's conference is there are workshops on everything. Right. How to write a query letter, how to self-publish, oh, right. yeah, how yeah, to yeah. market your book, right. how to do this, how yeah, to do that. Yeah. Right. That was very informative. Um, so I do think people should look at all these resources, but exercise discernment and... Correct. Yes. Well, you're such an accomplished writer. I can't stress how wonderful this book is, everybody. Get it at your local bookstore. You won't be able to put it down. I'm so excited for my dear friend, Deborah Royce. Thank you so much for joining us on Truly Perfectly Palm Beach. And happy new year to you and happy healthy. Yeah, happy healthy yes. new year to you. And writing and reading, not writing, but reading a book is a wonderful way to exercise your mind for the new year, everybody, right? And if people have questions, I'll be at the Four Arts on Wednesday, oh, January 25th great. at 1.30 Good. at the we King will Library. Be there. We yeah. will be there. So Good. I'll answer anything and everything. Thank, Thank you. you. Congratulations.